Okay, Dr. H here. This lesson is on Mendelian genetics, and this guy right here is Gregor Mendel, who worked out a lot of the rules of inheritance and how uh, the patterns of inheritance, how traits are passed on from generation to generation. He was a monk who lived in uh, what is now the Czech Republic, I believe, uh, back in around 1860s. Uh, he was a contemporary of Darwin, though it's doubtful that their ideas ever crossed, path, crossed paths. Uh, and his model organism of choice was the ordinary garden pea. Okay, he was kind of in charge of the gardens there at the monastery where he, where he lived and worked. Uh, so that kind of gave him a lot of time to work with the peas and to study the inheritance patterns of them. Uh, and he chose a, a few traits, a few characteristics uh, that he followed. One of them was the color of the flowers, purple, these guys right here, and white, white flowers right there. The white's a little bit hard to see against the background. Uh, first thing that he did was he developed these what we call true breeding strains. And what that means is so for the pure bred or true breeding or pure bred purple plants, whenever he crossed two of these pure bred purple flowered pea plants together, they would always give purple flowered offspring and the same thing with the white okay they would always give white flowers when he crossed them and he called these purebred or true breeding plants the parental generation or P okay so he crossed them together he allowed them to cross fertilize and he came up with this next generation, the first generation offspring, or F1, that he called it. And what he saw was that all of the offspring had purple flowers, okay? No white flowers. So he found this very interesting. What happened to this white flower trait? Where did it go? So he went on, and his next experiments were to take two of these F1 plants and cross them. Uh, he allowed them to self-fertilize, or you know, you can also think of it as taking one F1 plant and allowing it to self-fertilize. And this gave rise to what we call the second generation offspring, or F2 plants. And what he saw in the F2 is very, very interesting. Okay, he saw about three quarters of the offspring were the purple color. Remember, both parents here are purple. Uh, but he also saw this the, the white color coming back. About 25%, about one-fourth of the plants had white flowers. And remember, we had not seen that white color for a, ge a generation. Okay, you can think of these guys' grandparents had white flowers, but their parents had purple flowers. Where did this white come from? So from these data, he made a couple big conclusions that we still use today. One of the main ones was the, uh, the idea of dominance and recessive. Okay? The, he used the term dominant to refer to that trait which shows up in the F1. So it's sort of dominant over the other one the white flower here. So the purple flower color is dominant over the white because it's what shows up here in the F1. And conversely, the recessive trait is the one that disappears in the F1 and only comes back here in the F2, though in a much lower percentage. The other idea that he came up with was the fact that in the, Organisms must have two copies of these, he called them heritable factors because he didn't know anything about genes or DNA or chromosomes or any of that. So he called them heritable factors. So he reasoned out that this plant right here, these, uh, let's see what color should I want, these F1 plants, okay, even though the, the flower color is purple, the allele that we call it now, for white, must be hidden in these F1 plants somewhere. Because for the offspring to express it, it has to come from the parents. So this 
term allele. It's one of the uh, real big genetics terms that we'll be using. Uh, very simply, an allele is just one of an one of the alternate forms of a gene. So, in the case of this experiment, we are looking at the gene for flower color, and it exists in two alleles: the purple allele and the white allele. So, Mendel studied a few different traits in his pea plants. Here is sort of here is a list of the ones that he looked at and you can kind of see them here the dominant trait listed here recessive trait listed here and the numbers that he got for the f2 generation remember this is crossing two of the f1s that both would have the dominant trait the dominant uh, phenotype and reducing those to a ratio and he got very very close to a three to one ratio for all of them uh, the furthest away he gets above a 3 to 1 here is the 3.15 to 1 in the flowers. And the furthest away below is a 2.84 to 1. So it's all very, very close to a 3 to 1 ratio. So it all seems to be following the same basic pattern. Okay, The dominant trait is visible in the F1. Only that trait's in the F1. In the F2, the recessive trait comes back in about 25% of the offspring. So how to explain this? What do we know now that can explain it? So sort of moving forward a few, probably a few hundred years in explaining of genetics, because the work of Mendel, while it was great work, was sort of lost and ignored for, for a fairly long, long period. Um, but now, with our understanding of DNA and chromosomes and meiosis, we can kind of look and see, okay, we know that there are two copies of each gene because we get one copy from each parent. And we look here at the parental generation, the purple parent. It's purebred, so it has two copies of the dominant allele, and we use capital letters to designate that, so it is capital P, capital P. Whereas the recessive, the other parent, the purebred white flower, has two copies of the recessive allele. So we use lowercase p, lowercase p. The letters that we use aren't overly important, though I will say it's a very good idea when you're doing genetics problems to pick letters that look different in the capital and lowercase form. So P, probably not the best choice, but it's what we're using here in these, in these figures, so we'll, we'll just go with it. So the purple parent here can make uh, sperm and eggs with either, well, really with only the dominant allele. And likewise, the recessive can make sperm or eggs, actually sperm and eggs, because P plants usually make both. Uh, with the recessive alleles. And then when we cross them okay, and make the F1, we come up with one of each allele. Okay? And we call these organisms uh, that have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, we call them heterozygous. Okay? Hetero meaning different. This tells us that the two alleles are different, one dominant, one recessive. These guys up here, okay, the uh, purebred purple flower would be homozygous dominant, homo meaning the same, because both of its alleles are the same, and the white parent here would be homozygous recessive, because it has two copies of the recessive allele. Okay, so these terms genotype and phenotype, okay, very important to re to remember what these terms mean. Okay, and it's really quite easy to remember. Let me get rid of all that. Okay, the phenotype. Okay, think pH in phenotype stands for the physical appearance, what the organism looks like. Okay, so here, for example, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. That is the phenotype of these amazing little boys. 
whereas the genotype, okay, genotype stands for the, it refers to the genetic makeup. So the eyes, the blue eyes, we usually treat them sim simply as a recessive allele. So he has two copies, actually they both have two copies of the recessive eye color gene. And blonde hair, we usually also treat as recessive to brown hair. So we can say that he has two copies of a recessive allele for hair color. Okay, though it's actually a little bit more, comp more complex than that, but we'll just keep it simple for right now. Okay, so be sure that you keep these two terms straight. Okay, phenotype is the physical appearance. Genotype is the genetic makeup. Okay, physical appearance, the phenotype usually have two choices, dominant or recessive. For genotype, there's usually three choices, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous. Okay, and for the most part, heterozygous is going to look the same as homozygous dominant, okay, until we get to some more interesting genetics in the next few lessons. So how can we predict what we're going to get from a cross? Okay, we, uh, this is done through the use of what is called a Punnett square. Okay, so let's take a very simple cross. Let's, let's look at the F1 making the F2 cross. So for flower color, we have two parents. Uh, both of them are heterozygous for this allele, okay, capital P, lowercase p. Draw a little box, okay, a two by two box. Because remember, in meiosis, the alleles, the genes, the chromosomes really are going to split apart and they're going to get one copy of each in the sperm or the egg. So it doesn't really matter which one is on top, which one's on the side. Here we have eggs on the top, so half of the gametes would get this dominant allele for flower color, and the other half would get this allele. Okay, and the same thing with the sperm. I'll put the sperm over here. One half would be capital P, one half would be lowercase p. And then to fill in the Punnett square, uh, in the middle here are our predicted offspring. So this egg comes over here. Uh, the gene from the sperm comes over here, so we have big P, big P. Same thing in this box. Let's see, that is from there, and the lowercase p is from here. And we just do this for all four boxes. I'm not going to draw the arrows all over because it'll just get to be a mess. But egg comes down, sperm comes over, and then in the last box, same thing. Okay, so these are our four predicted offspring classes. And remember this, the, the word, I keep using the word predicted. Okay, remember that. That's very important to remember that these are just predictions. Okay, so we have the genotypes work out, but what will the phenotypes be? What will each of these flowers look like? And that's, that's a lot of times, that's, that's a little bit more important. You know, what is the organism going to look like? That one's going to be purple, obviously, because it has two copies of the purple allele, so that's all it can really be. These two here, remember, since purple is dominant over white, it's going to, they're both going to be purple. They're going to express that purple allele and not the white allele. And then this guy down here, the homozygous recessive individual, is going to have white flowers. And you should recognize this as the 3 to 1 ratio that Mendel saw. Okay, 1, 2, 3 purple flowers, 1 white flower. Okay, 75% purple, 25% white. So this is what we call a monohybrid cross. Mono meaning 1. Okay, so we are looking at one trait here, flower color. And monohybrid crosses are really quite simple. Uh, this... Uh, is a very good example of one. This is kind of how we worked them out using a Punnett square. But you should really probably get to the point where you can just look at a one of these monohybrid crosses, and these are the only six possible monohybrid crosses, and just be able to f know what the outcome is going to be without really having to work out the whole Punnett square. You know, the, the crosses are really very, very simple. Uh, and all the ratios are listed here. So you really should be able just to look at, say, this cross here, 
okay, homozygous dominant crossed with homozygous recessive, and realize that they are all going to be, the phenotype will be 100% dominant, and that the genotype will be 100% heterozygous, okay, and so just to kind of help you through that, or help you with these problems, you should just be able to recognize these, okay, it's really not all that hard, but if you still need to work out the Punnett squares, that's fine. I'm going to take a little time and a little bit of practice before we try to recognize them. Okay, that's not all that Mendel did. He also tracked two traits at one time, okay, and this is what we call a dye hybrid cross, dye meaning two. So now he's looking at two traits at once. So in this case, uh, still working with, with the pea plants here, but now instead of looking at the flowers, we're looking at the peas themselves. And the two traits that we're looking at are the shape of the pea, which can be either smooth or wrinkled. In this case, we have smooth for both parents. And the color of the pea. Uh, in this case, we have yellow for both parents. And yellow and smooth are both the dominant traits. So here we have the two F1 individuals. So they are heterozygous for both traits. And the first thing we need to do is figure out what will the gametes look like. Remember, gametes get one copy of each gene. So how many different gamete combinations are there for these individuals? So the way that we do that, we kind of use this method called FOIL, which you may recognize from math class. Okay, here are the uh, four possible gamete combinations in the eggs. And the way we got this, so capital S, capital Y, that comes from the first term in each, uh, from each gene. Uh, capital S, lowercase y, are the outers. Lowercase s, capital Y, those are the inners. And lowercase s, lowercase y is, are the last. Okay, so these are the four possible gamete combinations that we would have in the eggs. And we do the same thing over here for the other parent. These are making the sperm. Okay, and we see the same four possibilities. And filling in the Punnett square here, just by pulling everything down, we get this. Okay, and it's a fairly large Punnett square, you know, six, 16 possible choices, uh, and we see all the different uh, phenotypic combinations here. And you see the way that we write the genes out. We always keep letters together, okay, S's are always with S's, Y's are always with Y's. And we all usually try to write, now uh, they kind of have it wrong actually right here, we usually like to keep the capital letter, the dominant allele, in front before the lower case, the recessive one. And they, they, made a few other mistakes here, so I don't really like this. Uh, but if we count them up, we see, so let's start with the, uh, the dominant, dominant individuals. Uh, that would be the round yellow peas. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of those. Okay, so nine out of 16 are dominant, are round and yellow, so both dominant traits. Uh, we have three here, one, two, three that are round and green, so that's one dominant and one recessive trait. Uh, here we have these three, which are wrinkled and yellow, so that's, again, one recessive and one dominant trait in this case. And one little guy down here, which is uh, green and wrinkled, so he, that single P there is the double recessive individual. But remember, it's not like it, there's one P out of 16, it's one plant out of every 16 has that type of that shape and color of peas. Uh, but remember, these are just predictions, okay? So we shouldn't be surprised if we get something a little bit off of that. Okay, so this method works fairly well for doing dihybrid di crosses. Um, can get to be a little bit tedious if you don't like making these big Punnett squares, these four, four by four Punnett squares. So there is another method. And that method involves recognizing this, this cross, as really being two monohybrid crosses. Okay, the first one uh, for 
pod or P shape being uh, heterozygous cross with heterozygous and the results there would be three quarter smooth and one quarter wrinkled. And the other trait, the other cross is heterozygous again for color. And this would give you similar results of three quarter yellow, one quarter green. So to combine them and figure out what the offspring ratio would be for a certain phenotypic class, we just multiply the frequencies together. So if we want to figure out how many green wrinkled peas there would be, we take one fourth times one fourth, okay, and we get one sixteenth. Or say we want to know how many smooth and yellow we would get. So we multiply these two together. Three fourths by three fourths, multiplied by three fourths is nine sixteenths. Okay, and that here are all of these worked out, and they agree exactly with what we saw in the Punnett square on the on on the last slide, okay, which they really should because it's just two ways of looking at the same thing. So either way you want to do it is fine. You will end up with the same answer. Uh, it just depends on which way is easier for you. Okay, and that is the end, and that's genetics.